have your to-do list. I invite you this morning, as we come together on the Sabbath day, to lean on Jesus Christ and put him at the top of that to-do list. I want you to find rest in God's love. I want you to let God fill your emptiness with joy. And some people have said to me, Tim, how do I find emptiness in this chaos? Now, excuse me, how do I find joy in this chaos? Because I feel very empty. Well, that's what we have to work on and pray about, isn't it, church? So if you are currently wandering through the wilderness, if you are looking for manna from God, this service today can be your manna. The biblical text that will be read to you today. The singing that will be done today. The prayers that will be done today. Let that be your biblical manna for today. This is the time that God has set aside for us to be together. Amen? Okay, let us pray. Dear and Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the Sabbath day. And Father, we thank you for the, for the sky that is above us today and the ground that is below our feet. And eternal guard, we ask that you would part the veil that blinds us to unity as your beloved children. And when those that we love hurt, help us let go of our pain and find the balm of forgiveness to help them. And when we feel abandoned by anything that we trust, Help us to be able to adjust with a Christian attitude and help us seek your peace and reconciliation. And Father, when our hearts are pierced with anguish, when many of us have dealt with illnesses, COVID illnesses, and death, Father, help us to find those who will bring solace through your loving spirit. Amen. And now if you would stand, or you can remain seated actually, go ahead and remain seated. Our call of worship is found in your bulletin, and it is a responsive call of worship, and if we could join together at this time. When hatred and division separate us, God's love binds us together. When quarrels estrange us from one another, Christ's light shows us the way to reconciliation. When we feel excluded, when we feel left out, the, the spirit, spirit of peace is our pain. When all hope of fellowship seems lost, God's, God's grace restores our hope. Come now, let us worship God who makes us one. Amen. And now this morning, Luke Shaw will come forward, or Lily, who's coming forward? Lily, you're coming forward this morning. And Lily's going to be reading Psalm 133 for the church this morning. So open your ears and open your eyes to the Holy Word of God in His first reading today. Good morning. Good morning. I'm reading Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like a precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Amen. Words of encouragement for this morning. Thank you, Lily. So Mr. 
Luke Shaw will come to the pulpit, and he has some special music prepared for us this morning. And um, he said to me, he said, Dad, this Sunday I want to I sing He Touched Me. And uh, you all know who wrote He Touched Me and who was famous for saying that? Elvis Presley. In fact, one of his uh, albums he did was uh, He Touched Me. Um, and I believe that Elvis was inspired with that song because he loved it so much. Uh, because of his love. We know that Elvis Presley and his mother were, had a great relationship, and he, as a lot of young boys do, and a lot of grown men do, they just they love their moms. There's nothing wrong with that. This morning, I'm singing about, I mean, I'm preaching about uh, Jesus and what a wonderful shepherd and leader he was, and how he would reach out to people, and he would touch them, and then they would follow him. And today's talk is, will you follow me? And today, Luke comes and he said, Dad, I believe this is appropriate for your message today. This is Luke Shaw from the church. Thank you. Pharaoh's palace. 
Joseph spoke to his brothers, saying, I am Joseph. Is my father really still alive? But his brothers couldn't say a word. They were speechless. They couldn't believe what they were hearing and seeing. Come closer to me, Joseph said to his brothers. They came closer. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But don't feel badly. Don't blame yourselves for selling me. God was behind it. God sent me here ahead of you to save lives. There, was, there has been a famine in the land now for two years. The famine will continue for five more years, neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me on ahead to pave the way on and make sure there was a remnant in the land to save our lives in an amazing act of deliverance. So you see, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He sent me in place as a father to Pharaoh, put me in charge of his personal affairs, and made me ruler of all Egypt. Hurry back to my father. Tell him, your son Joseph says, I'm master of all of Egypt. Come as fast as you can and join me here. I'll give you a place to live in Goshen where you'll be close to me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your birds, and anything else you can think of. I'll take care of you there completely. There are still five more years of famine ahead. I'll make sure all of your needs are taken care of. You and everyone connected with you. You don't want for a thing. You won't want for a thing. Look at me. You can see for yourselves, and my brother Benjamin can see for himself, that it's me, my own mouth, telling you all this. Tell my father all about the high position I hold in Egypt. Tell him everything you've seen here, but don't take all day. Hurry up and get my father down here. Then Joseph threw himself on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. He then kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Only then were his brothers able to talk with him. My second reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, and then skipping to verses 29 through 32. Does this mean then that God is so fed up with Israel that he'll have nothing more to do with them? Hardly. Remember that I, the one writing these things, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham out of the tribe of Benjamin can't get much more Semitic than that. So we're not talking about repudiation. God has, long, has been too long involved with Israel, has too much invested to simply wash his hands of them. I want to lay all this out on the table as clearly as I can, friends. This is complicated. It would be easy to misinterpret what's going on and arrogantly assume that you're royalty and they're just rabble. Out on their ears for good, but that's not it at, that's not it at all. This hardness of the part of on the part of his, inside of Israel toward God is temporary. Its effect is to open things up to all the outsiders, so that we end up with a full house. Before it's all over, there will be a complete Israel, as it is written: a champion will stride down from the mountain of Zion. He'll clean house in Jacob. And this is my commitment to my people, removal of their sins. From your point of view, as you hear and embrace the good news of the message, it looks like the Jews are God's enemies. But look back from the long-range perspective of God's overall purpose, they remain God's oldest friends. God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled, and never rescinded. There was a time not long ago when you were out on when you were on the outs with God, but then the Jews slammed the door on him and things opened up for you. Now they are on the outs, but with the door held wide open for you, they have a way back in. In one way or another, God makes sure that we all experience what is what it means to be outside 
so that he can personally open the door and welcome us back in. May God add his blessings to the reading and hearing and the understanding of his only word this day. Amen. Amen.
So we know that God has a plan that we're a part of. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, this morning, uh, it is time for us to pray together as a group. And this is called intercessory prayers and a time of joys and concerns. That covers a lot of areas, doesn't it? It really does. Um, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to share your joys, your concerns, your prayers, your, your, uh, your lifting up of people's names and situations. But first, let me just go to my phone here and just put down what I know is, is important and is part of the life of the church. First of all, this morning, I want to thank you for good neighbors, God. You know, uh, the Bible says explicitly, treat your neighbors like you would treat yourself, doesn't it? Part of us, the Christian extension, is, hey, we got to be good to our neighbors. How many of you have good neighbors that live around you? Amen. Isn't that great? You are blessed people. That's God's taking care of you. I, I remember a few years ago, just a year ago, whenever I went out, Doris looked at me and I was, uh, I was talking with her and I was very concerned about Doris being alone. And she looked at me as I drove her home one day from church. And she said, Tim, I'm very blessed. I have good neighbors and they look out for me. You know, I, I, I thank God this morning for neighbors. I came home last night and I had a head full of steam still and I couldn't sit down and relax. So I said, I'll cut the grass and do some yard work at 7 o'clock. And I realized with her, I didn't have any, any bags to put those clippings in. And so I, I said, what am I going to do? I really don't, I, I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm, the, the sun's coming down. I can't get in the car and run down the lows. So I've got to put on my mask. I've got to stand in line. I've got to get the guy in front of me six feet space. They, they, they want to get out of there too. I, I, so what I do, I text my neighbor on the right and my neighbor across the street. And guess what? Within just a few minutes, I had three bags to put my clippings in. So I thank God this morning for good neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, it is received. Also this morning, I received a prayer request from Charlie Holt. And Charlie's got to where he, he really likes to send me these prayer requests. And I want to read it to you. Pastor Tim, would you do me a favor? I want to continue to pray for John Dalty, my co-worker, who suffered from cancer. I want to also pray for Freddie Bishop. And I was wondering if you have Freddie Bishop's address, where he is now, and I'd like to send him a card for me. I'd like uh, to send him a letter telling him that I'm thinking about him, and I hope that he's going to be all right eventually. Pastor Tim, I want you to know that uh, I worked tonight at the pizza place. That was last night. But I am off of both of my jobs tomorrow. I'm going to go by the graveyard and put flowers on my grandparents' grave and my mom and daddy's grave, and then he sent me pictures of the flowers on the grave. Charlie, thank you. Your prayers have been repeated. Lord, in your mercy, it is received. Also, this morning, I want to pray for my mom and dad. Uh, you know that they're, they've been struggling, and they plan on being here this morning, and as we were about ready to go pick them up, we got called, and thanks for not good for them physically, so they're going to have to not come to church this morning. So I pray for my mom and daddy. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. it is received. Also this morning, I pray for my daughter-in-law, Sanjay, and also my son, Timothy, who are on the road. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. God bless Okay, now, I open this floor of the church up for prayer requests. Just raise your hand, I'll recognize you. Yes, Susan. I'd like to pray for the family of Candace Hennett, little five-year-old that was shot this week. And pray for the whole country as as we just try to figure out what's happening to us and things like that can happen. Cameron, this is first Cameron. 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 Well, five-year-old boy. Five years old. Was shot in the head by his next-door neighbor because he had ridden his bicycle in that guy's yard. was shot in front of his two sisters. Lord, as we receive the news of this senseless murder and this violent act, 
Father, we wonder and we scratch our heads, what, what in the world has humanity become? And Father, we ask that you would wrap your arms around those family members that have been affected by this horrible act of violence. And as Susan said so perfectly and profoundly, Father, where are we headed? What is this? What have we become? Father, this is our prayer this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Anyone else this morning yet? Yes, Melania. Um, I just want to say a prayer of Thanksgiving that um, my family has stayed healthy and that um, in these times that I have a job. Um, but I also want to play, pray for all my um, co-workers. Um, it's just been very, very challenging the past several months. And um, when I was off today, several, I, I told them I was going, I was like, I get to go to church. And, you know, several people said, well, can you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? And it's, um, it's just, just very challenging. I'm thankful, you know, that we've stayed healthy and, you know, I am able to help, you know, people um, and care for people. I, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Um, and we've talked about that. That's my, you know, this is my purpose. That's your mission. Yeah. But it's, it's just been very challenging. And some of, you know, my coworkers are having a really, really I hear the, I hear your petition of prayer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna encapsulate it and kind of repeat it for the congregation. Malaya works every Sunday. She is a registered nurse at Trident Hospital. Uh, she is a frontline health care giver. Um, she is thankful that her family has good health and that they have their jobs. And then she says also that her mission, and always she has thought her mission was to be a caregiver, to work in the medical field, and to help others. And God has, has completed that mission for her. She's on the front line at, at Trident Hospital, and she's dealing with illnesses, and she's dealing with, uh, with death. And at the same time, she, she reflects on the, the mindset of her co-workers. And basically what I heard Elena says is it's not easy. That's a tough environment to be in. And when she reflected to them that she was so excited that she had this Sunday off because she's going to be back in church and be able to pray and give thanks for what God has already done for her and her family, her co-worker said, well, lady, will you do me a favor and also pray for me? That's exactly where my sermon and my theological reflection is going today. So this morning it is before God. We thank God for Melinda. We thank God for her gifts and talents. We thank God for her, for her, her honoring the human birth people and working with and for them. And we thank God that she's our church member and that she is the mother of Lily and Nicholas and the wife of Pat. Lord, in your mercy, it is received. Yes, Pat. Rosemary Corley. Mary Ashley Barbeau, who still is in need of a kidney. Sandra West. Sandra West.
core of our society are, is our churches and our school system in America. Right now, schools across America are doing a dance trying to figure out how teachers, students, administrators are going to make this puzzle work out so that it Y'all know the flip side. We've gone through stages since February with COVID-19, but what we're getting ready to go into now, with schools trying to reopen and have in-person teaching of students around teachers, facilitators, and administrators, we have got put the power of prayer in place so that there's going to be a wall of protection for those kindergartners, those high school students, those college students, our babies. Amen? Amen. Not to mention our wives and our husbands who are educators. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anyone else this morning? Yes. Skip the latest person. I want to say a prayer of thanksgiving for um, Debbie had a prayer answered in her life. And I just, she's in a good place. Amen. 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 Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer of thanksgiving and praise for a prayer that's answered for Debbie Westendorf Seifer. 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 It is received. Yes, Garrett's going to turn up. Just another prayer for um, Rosemary Corley. And um, a prayer of thanksgiving for the Holy Spirit who lifts me out when I most need it. And a prayer of thanksgiving for uh, Joe and Mary Floyd. They are my angels. And they are, God has put them in a the position where they are fantastic. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It is received. Anyone else? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Most merciful and holy God, we come before you this day. And our prayers are many. Oh, Father, we, are, we literally have dipped down into the, to the depths of our heart. Our, our souls are hurting. Our minds are dizzy with questions and apprehension. As Susan so perfectly stated, where are we headed as a society? I think, Lord, the question is, what's going on? Father's a little boy, I remember a song said you've got the whole world in your hands. you got the little baby children in your hands. Mamas and dads in your hands. Aunts and uncles in your hands. Father, my prayer today is simply this. That we not forget the theology of a little child's song that we put our lives in your hands, now and forever. And now let us pray in the name of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now, we will worship God with our morning tithes and offerings. And also, as we do each Sunday, we would like to share with you a song that will be performed by the Men's Ensemble as we practice six-foot social distancing. We will sing together this morning, Gentle Shepherd. If you would like now to come and bring your tithes and offerings, they put them in the offering plate. One is in the front and one is in the back. And if the gentlemen who are singing this morning would please come forward, we will sing together.
church. We ask that God would bless them in a special way, that he would multiply these gifts, and that they may honor him in a such a magnificent way. Amen. You may be seated. Church, if you would join me in the words of assurance prior to the reading of the gospel lesson this morning, it is about 20 minutes to 12. And last night I went over the kind of the recommendations and requirements from the South Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. And, and I've always tried to stay abreast of that each week so that I can make sure that we're doing all the right things to be safe in person on Sunday mornings. And so one of the things it suggested was shortening your services. So I'm cognizant of the time, and I will make sure that we are out of here before 12 o'clock. But I enjoy so much being with you on Sunday morning. God bless you all. I love you. Thank you so much. And let us now join in the words of assurance. Even in the midst of apparent tragedy, God's love gathers up the fragments of our lives. Even in the midst of apparent rejection, God's faithfulness rescues us from despair. Even when we feel abandoned and alone, God calls us to find strength for the journey. Amen. Thanks be to God. Does that speak to you this morning? You got a yellow highlighter, highlight that one, take it home, put it on your refrigerator, or next to your laptop or your PC or whatever it is, or nail it to your bedroom wall. That is, that's words, um, words that are really good for today's world. I'm going to read the scripture lesson now. And it comes to us from the Gospel of St. Luke. And we see here in this Gospel, and I'm going to start in the 19th chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. And um, I like to kind of, I like the, 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 the 10 10 rule. You can read 10 verses before the scripture that you're going to preach on, and 10 verses after the scripture you're going to preach on. To get a better idea of what Jesus was up to. And then right here we see throughout the book of Luke that he's, he's performing a lot of miracles. And in this particular situation, Jesus has just left along with the twelve. He just has left Jericho. And he's on the outskirts of Jericho. And there's a blind man who's sitting there and he's asking for handouts. And all he wants to do is see again. And he heard that Jesus is in the group. And, and he says, uh, Jesus, Jesus, as he's screaming his name, and Jesus says, what do you want from me? And the man said, I want to see again, Master. I'm tired of walking around and feeding off of whatever crumbs fall off the table. In other words, Master, I want to be able to see again, and I want to slice in the cake. I'm tired of eating the crumbs off the table. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you today, and you are healed. And in that instant, the gospel lesson says, the man looked up, and he began to see. And then he followed Jesus, shouting, glorifying God. And everyone in the street joined in, shouting praises to God. So I just set you up now. Now Jesus continues his journey. And I said previously that he and his boys, his disciples, and his ladies, because we do know that there were female disciples and followers of Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you want to get into the, the nitty-gritty of it, the, the biblical text says that the women were the reason Jesus had finances. They had a way of bringing money to the table so that they could finance his ministry. So we see the importance of all players in the role of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now today I shall read from you one of my favorite, favorite scriptures in the gospel. And it's the story of the little short man. And I'm not talking about Danny and Peter. <laughs> I'm talking about the man's name that starts with a Z, church. 
church, and it's not Zorro. And his name is what? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Then Jesus entered and he walked through the land of Jericho. And there was a man there, his name was Zacchaeus. And in that town he was known as the head tax collector. And he was quite rich, the Bible says. He wanted desperately to see Jesus because he heard that Jesus was coming to his town. But the crowds were in his way. And he was short in stature, this man, and he could not see over any of the crowds that gathered to speak. So he ran on ahead, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus as he came by. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and he said these words, Zacchaeus, hurry down from that tree, for today is my day to be a guest in your home. And at that point, Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing in his good luck and his ears. And he was so delighted to take Jesus home with him. But everyone who saw this incident was indignant. And they grumbled. And they said to themselves, what business does Jesus have getting cozy with this crook? Because we all know that in that day, the tax collectors were not loved people. They padded their own pockets. If they were told to go to a household or a business to pick up five shekels, they would go and say you could do 15 shekels, and they'd put 10 of them in their pocket, and then they would take five to their boss. And they were despised. Zacchaeus, the Bible says, stood there and was stunned, is the word that the Bible says. He stammered apologetically as Jesus looked right into his eyes as he looked down at the short man. And Zacchaeus then said these words, Master, I give away half of my income to the poor, and if I am caught cheating, I will pay four times the damages. Jesus then said, Zacchaeus, today is salvation in this house. Here he is, Zacchaeus, the son of Abraham, for the son of man came to find and restore to the lost. These are encouraging words. It talks about change and acceptance. These are the words of God that have prepared and read to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every heart in this room may they be acceptable in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at Jesus for a second. I want us to somehow almost do a comparison this morning. As opposed to me being so much in the preaching mode, I'd rather be on the teaching mode this morning. And I want us to compare the model that Jesus used in his walk on earth, and how he dealt with people who were deep, how he dealt with people, how he dealt with people who were sinners, those that were the good people in the synagogue, those that were the bad people, and, and, and what all came up. And, and so therefore, first, let me just mention this. What did Jesus come from? We all know that answer, right? Jesus came as our Messiah, our Lord and Savior. Pat said it perfectly. Jesus came to save us. Okay. Now, in order to be an effective leader, in order to be able to save us, I, I've studied this scripture, and I've studied the role of Jesus, and I have found that Jesus is a servant leader. He doesn't serve himself. He serves to be others. Then I also realized that Jesus took the initiative to mentor to people, Susan. What did Jesus do with Zacchaeus? Lord, Jericho's full of people. He's walking down the road. He's not pulling out anybody else. He gets to the point, he sees a sycamore tree, and there's Zacchaeus of the tree. He literally is one of those people in our lives, church, that we say is, oh, you know him, dude? As far as I heard, last I heard, he was up the tree. Y'all know where that saying comes from now, don't you? So you learned something today. So Zacchaeus is up a tree, and here comes my Jesus. He took the initiative to mentor to people. 
and not just the good people who fit the quota the quota of uh, being church people. You know, I grew up in the church. Herb and I talk about this all the time. I mean, I learned early on that there were people in the church that I grew up in that said, you got to be a certain way to come to this church. And I realized by the time I was about 10 years old that the church is for who church? Everyone. Everyone. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are Christians in his sight. Jesus loves little children of the world. Do you see me going back to my roots of church? Do you see how important that is? That's why faith is here today. Faith is like a sponge. She's like I was as a little boy. I, I just, I, I, she, if, if she could, she'd be right next to me saying, Pastor Tim, what can I do next to you? Help me. So we see that Jesus is a servant ministry minister and he has a mission. Part of his mission is, he, is that he prays for people privately. How many of you, let me ask you something. We're a small group of about 40 people. How many of you pray for other people? Just raise your hand. God bless you. How, how many of you people, uh, and I've got written here, Jesus, not only did he pray for people privately, he encouraged me. Okay. How many people need to be encouraged today, Pat? Do you see a lot of people need to be encouraged? Oh, man, I see. Even down to the fellow I waited on yesterday and served for about an hour or so, and the liquor on his bread had me hop. <laughs> I hadn't had a drink since the year before I got married. I've been married 30 years ago. Because alcohol was running me around the, the, the basketball court like a jungle. I said, I've got to stop this mess. God don't want me to walk around acting like a idiot. We've got to pray for people, and I mean all kinds of people, even people who are in your face with alcohol on their breath. Then part two is, let me just ask you, what is and was Jesus' mission when he was on earth? The Bible says that Jesus' mission is to seek and save the loss. Now, did he, and I'm going to use this as a, I don't, don't want to get in trouble, but I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus came to Charleston Day Church, I don't think he would start a few on I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I didn't say that. But I do think he would start on the east side and the west side of downtown Charleston. Yeah. Or maybe over Practice Street, where east side, west side, and the other side of the road is run again. Jesus sought to seek and save those who were lost. So let me ask you about Zacchaeus. Y'all all know the story. Was he loved? Yes or no? Huh? Was he respected in the town of Jericho? Yes or no? Was he accepted? Now, you told me he wasn't rejected, he was respected, but was he accepted? Let me ask you this, here's the easy question. Was he tall? No. Here's another question. Was he lost? Yes. Of course he was, church. And Jesus sought him out in a crowd of people, and Jesus chose to dine in his house in order to offer him a new and Jesus is doing that today, but we are the ones who have to do the inviting. And now you know the core of my message. Now you know the core of my message. Mary told me yesterday, preach a good sermon. My baby sister's coming to church tomorrow. Does somebody say amen? amen. Baby sister, how am I doing so far? Doing okay? Melana sent me a text message because I sent her a message on Thursday morning. I want you to know something. I'm praying for you and I'm praying for your family. And she said, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be in church Sunday because I don't have to work. Somebody say amen. amen. The coronavirus has ushered in one of the greatest opportunities to witness in our lifetimes. Millions of 
people are seeking coping mechanisms to deal with the fear. Matt and I talked about that. That happened, Matt. Gary Goose. I hate to call you out, brother, but that's my style. I love you. You know that. God put you here for a reason. Ain't no reason in the world why you and I met in the yard one day, except that God put you and I together. Amen? You receive that. There are so many people today, and, I, and I've done my homework, church, and I've, I'm in the I'm, Listen, I'm not sitting in the ivory tower reading theology books. I'm out in the field. I'm talking to people. And here's just some of the things that I see people dealing with today. First of all is isolation. Somebody said to me yesterday, my mother and father won't go to the door. Much less go out. They've been in the house since late February. Do y'all know what it's like when senior people are dealing with isolation and the only two people they see are each other? Lord knows, even if they've been married 65 years, they get tired of looking at each other. <laughs> you, you hear me, Larry? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm just going to just say a few of them, and I want you to say it again after I say it. Some people are dealing with fear. Amen. Some people are dealing with isolation. Some people are dealing with insecurity. Amen. Some people are dealing with hopelessness. Amen. Some people are dealing with financial disasters. Amen. We all have a Zacchaeus in our lives, church, that we know right now is of a tree. But now is the time to share our faith and to lead our Zacchaeuses to Jesus the Christ. In Luke, in Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus said like this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Matthew 4, 19. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And every time I read that, I think of Gareth's days. And I don't know why, but God pointed me to the fisherman that you are. The Peter. The man who wasn't afraid to speak out, to follow Jesus. But he wasn't. Church, Jesus obviously intended for you and I to be soul winners. So let me ask you today, how many friends do you know who, need a, who don't need a hand out? They need a hand up. Do y'all know the difference? Somebody say amen. amen. Let, let me say it again. How many people and how many friends and family members do you know right now, they don't need a hand out. They need a hand up because they're lost. And that hits home for me. That hits right in my core circle. I don't live in a perfect world. I don't have a perfect faith. I'm just like you and all. How many people do you need to encourage today? How many people love your smile even though we all have to wear these masks? You know, one thing that I've always loved is the teeth that God gave me. When I was a boy, my brother said, you, you, you got ugly teeth. You got rabbit teeth. <laughs> the rest of us in the house got normal teeth. God bless you with rabbit teeth. And, and I'm just a little boy, but I'm going to tell you something. I looked in the mirror. I, was, I like what God, said, God did with me. He gave me blue eyes and black hair. He gave me white teeth. And I, and I like the way he gave it to me. And I would scrub them with bacon so that I would arm and hammer his box. Mama say, I take my 25 cents, that's how much Arm & Hammer baking soda was in the early, late 50s, early 60s, and buy a yellow box of Arm & Hammer and stick my toothbrush in it. And it's right now, I can't smile with a mask. And it, 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 it is, it, it's getting in the way of me being able to get close to people. And then I can't get close to that. Somebody said to me on Friday, I'm going to drive down now. And I don't care what the word says. I'm coming to see you, and I want a firm handshake that you get, and I want to hug you too. And I said, God, let it be. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are a light in the world. And when Jesus walked the earth, church, he was the light. But now you and I are the lights in the darkness of the world. Nothing is more valuable than the human soul. And Jesus said it like this. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? During COVID-19, 
2019, three of the largest online Christian sites report the number of people seeking information about learning more about Jesus has increased dramatically. Now here's why I do my homework. This is what they do in the news all day long. They shoot numbers at you. This is what the White House does. This is what, this is what NPR does. This is what CNN does. Y'all want to hear some numbers? Listen to this. Online media reports that there has been a 170% increase in searching about people finding the word hope on our social media and internet access. And there's been a 57% increase in searching about the word fear. And the University of Copenhagen has done a study that's just been completed. And it reports that searches about prayer in 75 countries, church, has skyrocketed to the highest levels in online history. Something's happened. And somebody say amen. amen. Jesus shared his love. He shared his story. He said share his faith. And so should you and I. So should we. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. You know I love when I was a little boy. They, they would take us to dinner. We weren't old enough to go into church on Sunday. And they had what they called children's church. You know there was a huge discussion. In one of my theology classes at Duke Divinity School about whether we should bring all the kids in the church on Sunday or have, quote, children's church. Because when children are in church, they learn how to become little Christians, don't they? One of the songs that we always sang at the end of my Sunday as a little boy was, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And we always sang it at the very end, and it hit me this week. Why do we say that at the end? Because it is an evangelistic tool to say, shine it all over Asbury Church. I'm going to let it shine. Shine it all over Charleston, South Carolina. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it in a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. That's what Jesus would have us to do during COVID-19. Listen to this story as I close. How many of you heard of Louis Pasteur? Remember who Louis Pasteur is? Anybody want to take a guess at what Louis Pasteur did? Created the first vaccine. Up until that time, of course, I know we've had animals and dogs and cats and all these other creatures and critters since the very beginning of man created, when God created the heavens and the earth and everything that crawled in it. Amen? Y'all are all creationalists. Y'all understand that aspect of creation. Well, back then, if you were scratched by a cat or bitten by a dog, there was no cure for rabies, Susan. So listen to this story. Louis Pasteur, the, power, the pioneer of immunology, immunology, lived at a time when thousands of people died each year from rabies. And Louis Pasteur had worked for years on a vaccine. And just as he was to begin to experiment with the vaccine, the only person he had to experiment on was himself. And he literally, the next day, he was getting ready to inject himself with the vaccine. When a mama and a nine-year-old boy named Joseph Meister came to see Mr. Pasteur. You see, nine-year-old Joe Mas Meister had been bitten by a rabid dog. And the boy's mother came running to Pasteur and begged him to experiment on her son with his new vaccine. Church, I want you to hear this. Because there's hope in this, we need a vaccine, church. Oh, God can give us a vaccine. Somebody say amen. Pasteur injected Joseph each day for the next 10 days. And the boy beat rabies. And he lived and grew up to be an old man. And decades later, of all the things that Louis Pasteur could have etched 
on his tombstone. He asked his family for these three words to be put on his tombstone. Three words, church. And they are Joseph Meister lived. The little boy that he had put the vaccine in as a test lived, and that was his claim. That was his mission. Our greatest legacy will be those who live eternally because of you, of your efforts to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Because you are called by Jesus to do the Great Commission, which is Matthew 28. Go out into the world and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them the things that I have taught you. I heard this week in my journey these statements as I close. Number one, Tim, when all this mess gets over with, I'm going to come to your church. Why don't you come now? I can guarantee you one thing. If we had the vaccine that has Mary St. James, guess what we would have, church? Oh, we have to do crowd control. We had a good old pack here to work. We'd have to put Matt Garagusi in charge of the people. And I'd go back to my office and hide and pray. Tim, when all this is over, I'm going to come to your church. What about today? How about this? Tim, I'm not a religious person, but I don't know where else to turn but to God. Let me close. The destiny of the human race was placed into the hands of Jesus the Christ. But now Jesus the Christ has placed the destiny of other people's lives into mine and your hands. God is counting on us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that has been presented to the people of God. Oh, Father, they have now heard the message. Oh, Father, let them now become the messengers. Let them go out into a world that even though we are told we can't touch, we can't get close to, we can't not wear a mask, we cannot be social, there's still a way to bring people to Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, may you hear my mouth, may you adorn and endorse my words, and may they be heard. Amen. Let us, you can continue to sit, you can stand, you can do whatever you want to do, but today we're going to sing a final hymn.
morning to church. Thank you for keeping our morales up. And let us continue to be able to worship God and be creative in a most magnificent way. Now go out today and enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy your Sabbath day. Do whatever it is that you do. And know that God is walking with you. You see, church, you have taken the time out of your day. It would have been so much easier for you to stay at home. It would have been so much easier for you to just stay in your pajamas or your room. But you made the effort to come forth with God and to worship His holy Son, Jesus. God bless you all. And now we're forward in peace. And may the peace of God go with thee in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. May He 